welcome. And uh, if you're visiting, a special welcome to you. Also, uh, your weekly reminder to please silence your cell phones and electronic devices so the service is not interrupted. Uh, next Lord's Day, in order to assist you in your preparations for the worship service, please read Psalm 101. The Wednesday evening Bible study will continue, Lord willing, this week at 7 o'clock here at the church building and on Zoom. The Sunday school schedule you see here in front of you, because there are still a couple of um, things that are not the regular scheduled Sunday school in there, so you can take note of that. And there's also a Lord's Supper preparation in the bulletin, because next week will be the first Sunday of the month, so we'll be celebrating the Lord's Supper and have our uh, fellowship meal as well. Uh, something that's not in your bulletin, uh, the consistory is looking for good ideas for family activity get-togethers. So if you have any ideas, I won't make any judgments as to whether they're good or bad, but you can bring your ideas, and <laughs> we're taking all ideas at this point. So um, I think we have probably the baseball game coming up this summer, and not much else planned. So if you have anything that comes to mind, just run it by any member of the consistory and we'll see if it actually works out because we like, we like to get together and spend time in fellowship together. So any idea is a good idea. And uh, with that, we'll take a moment of silent preparation before pastor begins the service. Congregation of the Lord, let's rise as we hear from the final chapter of the Gospel of John. Now Thomas called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciple therefore said to him, other disciples, pardon me, therefore said to him, we have seen the Lord. So he said to them, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach here, reach your finger here and look at my hands and reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Congregation of the Lord, the Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Let us go before our Lord in prayer. Uh, pardon me, in uh, singing together the Gloria Patri. Thank you, our Heavenly Father, that uh, we are blessed because we do see, we, we do believe having not seen. What a blessing it is to come and in faith worship that risen one, worship you, our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and we can do so because he not only died and was buried, but is raised and even now intercedes. We ask that you would hear us for Jesus' sake. Amen. And let's uh, remain standing and turn in our red hymnals now to 266. Come, ye faithful, raise the strain. 266.
please be seated. And now please find in your bulletin this uh, portion of the letter of John, 1 John chapter 3 and verses 4 through 8. And as our custom is arranged for our responsive reading, let us now read responsively, whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. So, congregation, now, as we consider these words uh, from God's word, take a time of uh, silent and personal prayer of confession, and we'll pray together. We do come, our Heavenly Father, into your presence this morning, and we thank you that we come as we come on these first days of the week, rejoicing in the resurrection of our Savior. We come rejoicing for the new life that we have now and the life that we have eternally. And we thank you for that sin-bearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who carried all of our sins to that cross, paying it all, even unto being placed in the ground and then to rise. But we confess uh, this morning that that was because of our sin, not his, because of our need and not his. We thank you that you have had such mercy upon us, such grace, even from before the creation that the Savior might come and save such as we are. And all those who have come before, who have uh, professed faith in the Savior, and those even under the Old Covenant, looking forward to that Savior who would come to pay for all the sins, we ask our Heavenly Father that you would have mercy upon us as we confess that though that mighty work has been done, that uh, we often continue to sin, and we continue to be lawless, as the Apostle reminds us. We ask our Heavenly Father that you would teach us the right way, that you would teach us obedience and teach us humility before you and before our neighbor, that we would be quick to seek your face and seek pardon because of sins, And also that we would seek to do that which is pleasing in your sight all of our days. And we know that both are true in us. But may we see even that small beginning of a greater obedience in this life. But we do look forward to that life to come wherein all righteousness is fulfilled. We will be glorified even as our Savior is. And what a glorious thing and a mysterious thing this is. But now it is good and right for us to confess our sins before you and to seek your face and seek your pardon for Jesus' sake. For what we have read reminds us that our Savior came that he might destroy the works of the devil. And what a wondrous thing this is. For that includes even our sin, 
For we know that our accuser, Satan, is the father of lies. And we know that he would seek all he can do, both to destroy the gospel and to destroy us. But that victory is already won. So we thank you, our Heavenly Father, that we can come with great assurance that you will look upon what the Savior has done, <clears throat> that you will look upon his shed blood, his resurrection, and therefore we will be pardoned. We rejoice in this together and ask that you would hear us for Jesus' name and sake. Amen. So let us bless the Lord and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. That is the God in whom we trust and whom we bless, who forgives all of our iniquities. Let us rejoice in what the Savior has done in turning to 279, which looks both to his death and burial, but also his resurrection. 279, and we'll stand to sing all five stanzas.
Please be seated. As we confess our faith uh, publicly and uh, as a congregation today, we use the words again, the Apostles' Creed, and now congregation, uh, I call upon you to confess what it is you believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose from the dead, he descended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And also Article 11 from the Belgic Confession of Faith, a very short article compared to uh, some of the ones prior, and particularly here it is a confession in defense of the uh, deity of the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. And so we believe and confess also that the Holy Spirit from eternity proceeds from the Father and the Son. And therefore, is, neither is made, created, nor begotten, but only proceeds from both. Who in order is the third person of the Holy Trinity, of one and the same essence, majesty, and glory with the Father and the Son, and therefore is the true and eternal God, as the Holy Scriptures teach us. And so when we confess... Uh, the Trinity, three and one, uh, one and three, the same essence, uh, three persons, one God. This includes, of course, the Holy Spirit. And, of course, the, the Belgian Confession here repeats uh, what was established um, at Nicaea regarding the procession of the Holy Spirit from the Father and the Son. So over, well, more or less a thousand years, a little more than a thousand years later, we uh, repeat this. Um, it is what we hold, and there is certainly mystery in it. Uh, nevertheless, uh, this is what the scriptures teach, and therefore rightly we worship the triune God who has revealed himself in the scriptures, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Well, now let us turn to 340 in the hymnal, in the red Hymnal 340, which is uh, focused on uh, the, the Holy Spirit, will stand uh, to sing and remain standing for the reading of God's Word after.
please remain standing if you're able and turn with me first in the Old Testament to the book of Job. Book of Job, chapter 19. Short reading of four verses, beginning at verse 24. Job 19, beginning at verse 24. Read the verse 27. Pardon me, it should be verse 23, pardon me. Oh, that my words were written, oh, that they were inscribed in a book, that they were engraved on a rock with an iron pen and lead forever. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another, how my heart yearns within me. That is God's word from the book of Job, chapter 19. And now we turn to the Gospel of John, Gospel of John, chapter 6. And we have a somewhat longer reading here from the Gospel of John, chapter 6. We will begin at verse 39, reading through verse 54. John 39, chapter 6, verse 39. This, likewise, is God's Word. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. The Jews then complained about him, because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he says, I have come down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered and said to them, Do not murmur among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that, any, not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever in the bread which I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore quarreled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? And Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. And we end there. At verse 34, congregation, God's word, if you've heard and received it, then as his very word, confess that with me now by saying, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, let's pray. Come, our Heavenly Father, and do thank you for these words that we have read and heard. And though... These are familiar words to many of us, no doubt. May they be uh, afresh in our hearts and our understanding. May we peer into the glorious mystery revealed to us in these verses. Ask that you would also bless that proclamation of your word. And ask in Jesus' name, amen. Well, it is uh, part of life, of course, that it is difficult now to watch or read 
the news or any current events without hearing about someone being offended by something or someone. Uh, I suppose then it would be fine for me to just say I'm offended at how sensitive some people are, but that sort of just adds rather than solves the problem, I suppose. And if we pause for a moment, though, to consider that it is what people are claiming to be offended by, most of the time it's some pretty mild and harmless stuff. Sometimes it's serious. And I really don't care if someone doesn't like the gray hair on my head or that I don't wear the latest fashions. There are a lot more important things in life than that. Now, this doesn't mean that there are things that we shouldn't be disturbed about. Of course there are. We're disturbed by a great many of things, many things, and rightly so. And in the text that we just read, there were those that heard the teaching of the Savior and were offended at what he said. And in fact, I think we can say that what he said was offensive. At least it's offensive to one who does not understand what he said. But to those who have actually had their eyes opened, the words that we just read are precious words. And there is one promise in particular that is most precious. And that promise is that he will raise up those who hear his words and receive them, and he will raise them up on the last day. That is, they are the word of resurrection. It's the word of life. And they're repeated over and over again in the text today. And I realize that we broke into the middle of a context. We didn't read what came before nor much of what came after. We really... Our focus is on the text that I read today, and even parts of that won't be touched so much. But we want to look here more particularly at verses 39 and 40. And what we see here in these two verses is that the, it is the Father's will that none of those given to Christ will be lost. And so what the Savior is informing the crowd is that there are those who are given to him. Now that implies, I, rightly so, that a transaction has taken place. It implies that there were some also who were not given to him. At least, certainly not in the same way. And what we hear here, what we read, is an expression of what happened in eternity past, which is a nonsensical statement if you understand what eternity is, but eternity before the cosmos. And that was that in eternity the Father elected some to salvation. He gave them to his only begotten Son. Now what that's called in theological terms is the covenant of redemption or the council of peace or different ways in which that's called. That is, between the persons of the Godhead, the determination to save some was done and that is that the Father gave some who are yet uncreated, unborn, gave them to his only begotten Son. And it was the Holy Spirit who applies that, that um, accomplishment to those who have been given to the Son. But it is not only that they have been given to him, but it is also that those who are given to him, will he will not lose any of them. Any of them. Now, have you ever given something to some, something, someone something that was precious, precious to you, and then they lost it? Well, that happened to me. <laughs> um, you know I use a, a phrase here about trusted uh, borrower list. <laughs> I had a very precious book that I knew somebody might be interested in. It was uh, published exactly 200 years ago this year. And it's, uh, maybe sometime I'll bring it in. It's a fascinating little book. But regardless, it was prized in my, in my library, and, it was, and it's unique in my library. Um, bought it at the same time I bought Schlegel's Philosophy of History, but that's another, another book. Um, but the person who borrowed it from me was trustworthy, and, they, and yet they lost it or misplaced it or something. And I lent it to them as a trust. And nevertheless, somehow, it wasn't as precious to them or 
something and they misplaced it. And they didn't, uh, when I asked about it, some weeks and months later, they said, you never lent that to me. Oh. Yes, I did, <laughs> in fact. Um, but about a year ago, interestingly, I found it. I found it in the most unexpected place. It was in a different, someone else's library somewhere else. They had passed it on or something. I don't exactly know how it got there, but now it's back in my library. <laughs> okay. That's something like that. I'm sure has happened to you that, that you had something that was precious. You maybe have lent it to somebody and they broke it or they lost it, those kinds of things. That's not like our Savior. He will lose exactly none who are given to him. And the value of what is entrusted to his care is so much more valuable than that old book. He's the good shepherd. He loses none of his sheep. He will preserve all of those who are given to him to the end. And, the end, in, and in the end, they will be raised up, resurrected. That is, it is the Son's purpose to raise the ones who are given to him and who are preserved unto the last day. That's his, in, that's his explicit purpose. And the promise of preservation that we have to those who are given to him, that is, would be a very cold comfort if there was an expiration date on our preservation. Now, especially in times such as ours, you may have heard or seen commercials lately about uh, survival food with a shelf life of 25 years. Have you seen that? You can buy a crate of food, and I'll be honest, I've thought about it. <laughs> um, as long as, as long as that is, 25 years, that's a long time for food to not go bad, it still has an expiration date. There's no, there's no expiration date stamped on your forehead. It, it's not there. Quite the contrary, you and I, those of us who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, we're marked for eternity. And that means those who are given to Christ must be raised at the last day must be raised, raised unto life eternal. That's true preservation. That's true keeping. You see, it is, that's not only the Son's purpose, but it is expressly here that it is the Father's will that everyone who sees and believes in the only begotten Son will have everlasting life. You see, what we read here, and going back more particularly to the text, is that the Savior is standing in the middle of a crowd that was intently listening to him. They were intently watching him. They saw him. But did they really see him? Did they really see him? See, what their response would indicate is that they did not actually really see him. That is, they did not see him for who he really was. See, to, to experience life in him, we must see him. Can you see him? Now, to be sure, I'm not asking you even at this moment to visualize what you think he looks like. That's not a particularly beneficial exercise. I would encourage you to not do that. But what I am asking you is if you can see him in the way that really matters. So you cannot see him without the eyes of faith. It is impossible. That is, it is impossible to see him unless you have spiritual eyes that are opened. And you cannot perceive who he is and you cannot believe on him unless your eyes have been opened. But you must see him. And to see and to believe on him is vital to your resurrection. That's what the text indicates because the promise goes to, to raise those in the last day are those who see and believe on him, place their trust in him. And so we perceive him with the eyes of faith, not creating 
pictures in our head. So that's, that's not what's being talked about. But perceiving what he has done, perceiving the glories of his redeeming work for us, placing on trust in that one who is revealed to us in his word. See, they, the way that they respond shows that they did not, in fact, as we would say, get it. You see, for the, for the one who sees, the one who believes, it, is said, it says here in the text explicitly that it is the Son's purpose to raise that one up at the last day. And when we are raised at the last day, we will behold him with our eyes, and what a glorious day that will be. Beloved, we are, we, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is, as we read in 1 John 3, 2. Or I would refer you back to Job that we read earlier. I know that my Redeemer lives. We can say the same thing as Job. I know that my Redeemer lives. I know at the last day he will stand upon the earth. I know that even though I die and I'm put in the ground, I know that I shall see who? God. That is, we will see our Redeemer, the God-man, with our eyes. See, that is the Son's purpose, but it's deeper than that, isn't it? Because the text also says, all who the Father draws will be raised. There's another element to it, isn't there? Well, in verse 41, we hear, or pardon me, we read that the Jews complained or they murmured at what Jesus had said to them. Have you ever heard, especially now at this time of year, you hear it a flock of birds chattering together. They're really happy, right? There's all the flowers and the seeds and all these things. That it's, that's the kind of activity that this Greek word describes. There was a going through the crowd. What did you hear him? What did he say? What, do you understand? What you, and this crowd noise. We see whether it was the Jews that were standing there and listening and actually seeing him with their physical eyes that day, or the world generally, they, they will just chatter and they will complain away, they'll murmur away, they say, what, what is this nonsense, the gospel, we're more advanced now, we have science, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. nobody believes that anymore anyway, moving on. See, that shows uh, an inherent discontent with the revelation of Christ as the only way. There is a, a natural, normal, we could say, fallen discontent with the message of the gospel, which says you have to see me with the eyes of faith. You have to believe on me. You have to trust that I will raise the one given to me at the last day. You have to trust that I will deliver you from your sins and the penalty of your sins. And so what we have here particularly is a crowd of so-called religious people dissatisfied with the message of the gospel. So what the Savior had just told them was one of the greatest promises that could ever be expressed to a crowd. They never, that they would never hunger, they would never thirst if they came to him as the bread from heaven and they believed on him. And one of my earliest memories in, my, at, uh, in church is going to, in a little Sunday school, I was, I was a little guy, maybe, maybe Paul's age, I don't know. Little guy. One of my first memories, and I can remember the Sunday school teacher, she said to me, do you want to live forever? <laughs> sure do. Actually, I don't want to live on this fallen earth forever. But I was, no question, absolutely. I had no idea what that meant. There's no way I could conceive, I think, at that young age, really what that meant. Still don't. But there it was. My hand was up. But these people, they didn't even put their hand up. So what is he talking about? This is nonsense. 
So it is today. All over the world today, the message of the gospel is being preached. The message particularly, most more than likely, about the resurrection power of the Savior and what that means regarding our own life, our own eternal life in Christ. And yet the world is like the birds chattering in the trees. They would be much happier if the message were softened or we could just compromise the message. You see, well, there's the Jesus thing, but there's also the living good thing, being a good person thing, or the multiple paths to God thing. That's okay. But don't you ever deny that Caesar is Lord and say that Jesus Christ is Lord. So the world murmurs, they want us to soften the message, they want us to compromise the message, and really just abandon the message altogether. And it constantly casts doubt upon the message, just like the crowd in our text. And I had a recent conversation with someone, I don't even remember who it was with. They were talking about, it was about a month before today. And they said, yep, have you noticed? Here it comes, all these things on the History Channel or here, but they're talking about, did Jesus really exist? I had never noticed that before. Didn't really, I don't really pay attention to those kinds of things, but they were absolutely right. Did Jesus really exist? Was it really a resurrection? So they murmur and they murmur and they doubt, it says. Now it's truly amazing here how this account, how, how relevant it is today. So they, they didn't doubt that Jesus of Nazareth existed. He was standing right in front of them. And in fact, no truly honest person doubts that Jesus existed. Jesus, the person, you know, they always put it in sort of weird phraseology. What they doubt is something much more subtle than that. You'll notice what the crowd says here as it's murmuring. He says, isn't this Joseph's son? How can he say he came down from heaven? Who, who is, whose parents? We know who his parents are. Of course, this, this is, by the way, a subject that continues to appear in, in his, his uh, controversies with the Pharisees about birth and where they came from and so on. See, they don't doubt. That's not the denial. It is that he could not possibly be who he says he is. That's what they have a problem with. Sure, you want to say that Jesus existed. The world doesn't care about that. Some guy named Yeshua back there in the first century, some teacher, revolutionary, rabbi, whatever you want to call him, that's fine. But don't you ever say that he is who he says he is. The only begotten son of the Father who came down and is the sacrifice for your sins. So the world can't believe it. The world is, it's in, uh, and the, pardon me, the crowd can't believe it, and so the world doesn't believe that. But why? Why is there this impulse to reject what Jesus says? Is it you and I, I, I trust if you're here, you're here voluntarily, <laughs> you're not under compulsion to be here, and you accept, I would trust, you accept something that others, a great many others, simply cannot accept. They, they would reject it out of hand. It is, is it because you're more gullible? Is that why? That's certainly one of the charges. The world will say, well, you know, that's good for you, kind of pat you on the head, patronizing. But really, gullibility is not the issue, is it? What is the issue, actually, is the truth of the claim and the ability to discern, to discern whether or not it is true. That's the issue. See, what the Savior declares here in these few verses is the absolute necessity of an inner spiritual work, that is, conversion to understand the truth. Now understand here, this was a, a group of people who were saturated in Torah, saturated in religious thought. 
He says, no one can come except. No one can come except. And he speaks in absolute terms. No one, nobody can come. Nobody has the power to receive the words of the gospel, even from the lips of Jesus Christ himself. No one except. Except is a great word. <laughs> Right there, no one can except. See, there's absolutely only one way that the claims of the Savior will be accepted. And it is not based upon rationality. It is not based upon gullibility. It's not even based upon verifiability according to the world's measure. It is not even actually spirituality. It is only possible when a supernatural event has taken place. And what is that supernatural event? That supernatural event is the drawing of the Father. And to understand, to gain a better understanding of the force of what's going on here, I want to point you to a couple of other words. Pardon me, a couple other passages. You don't, you don't have to turn there. You might want to note them. Two particularly from the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 16, verse 19, and this is in a, just a different context altogether, um, a mission, mission context, as it happens, it says, But when her masters saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. And so here, the dragging of Paul and Silas into the marketplace, that's the word that's used here in John 6. And a couple chapters later in chapter 21 in Acts, in verses 30 and 31, it says, And all the city was disturbed, and the people ran together, seized Paul, and dragged him out of the temple, and immediately the doors were shut. Now as they were seeking to kill him, news came to the commander, and so on. That, so this is two entirely different contexts. One is a pagan Gentile context, the other was in the temple in Jerusalem. In both cases, the idea that they seized him and dragged him out of the temple that's the same word that's used in John 6. There are some other examples, but don't want to belabor the point here. So you can see that this term implies a strong, compelling, impelling cause of change. See, outside of the Bible, for example, if you did a little bit of deeper research here, the word was used to refer to the reaction of magnets. If you have a strong magnet and you put it next to some iron, what happens? So the magnet, it draws that steel, that iron, to itself. And there are some awfully powerful magnets <laughs> that you can get. Uh, have, some, have some weird experiences with that as it happens. Remarkably strong. And so when the Father draws someone by the Holy Spirit, they are brought to God by an irresistible grace. An irresistible grace. It's like, it's like the young man wooing the object of his love. It is stronger than steel and more powerful than a thousand horses because her heart is changed. And so it is with the loving kindness of our sovereign God. In both those other examples I gave you from the book of Acts, it was for violence, it was for the wrong reason, but when our sovereign God draws us to himself, it's, the, it's because of love, loving kindness, that we're drawn to him. In Jeremiah 31.3, we read, The Lord has appeared of old to me, saying, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. Draw me away, we read at the very beginning of the Song of Solomon. Draw me away with this loving kindness, with this affection that is shown to us by the Father. And this loving drawing is the intent, as it says here in this text, it is the Son's purpose to raise those who have been converted, those who the Father has drawn.
Now, there is a, 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 a part of life, a natural, we might say, in this fallen world part of life, that there is death in this world. And the death of those close to us is actually the subject of many novels, isn't it? Or tragic plays or movies. And the reason for that is that it touches us in a very, very deep way. It's very tender to us. It's a universal experience. At some point, we will be separated from, from those who are close to us, whether our departing or their departing. Now, how tragic would it be, in fact, if after experiencing the loving kindness of God, we knew at some point we would be separated from our Savior? There would be very little and very shallow comfort in that, wouldn't there? But that's not our condition. That's not our hope. That's the nature, not the nature of who we are in Christ. It is the express intent of the Savior to raise you and to raise me up at the last day. And we know this because of what we read here in verse 44. I will raise him up. I will. Will, not might, not should, not can, not will. I, myself, will raise him up. And it must be so if we are united to Christ. We are, those who are united to Christ, we will be raised up. Now, what's the subject here in verses 45 to the end of our text? Today, Well, he starts speaking about being the bread of life. Now, it's a repeat of what he said earlier, as it happens, but at this point, we have to, we have to stop and, and think about what it is, in fact, he is claiming here. Well, first of all, again, as you may have guessed, um, and I sort of implied it earlier, I myself, I am it's emphatic. It can't be any more emphatic grammatically in the original. It's a verbal, and it's a verbal way of pointing to oneself. In English, we might say I, comma, I am, I, me, myself. The implication here is that there are no other who are fit to the predicate of the sentence. That is, there's no one else. That is the kind of bread that he's referring to. That is... There's no one else who is that kind of bread. And what is that bread? That is what the Savior is saying here is that he is the only bread of life. It doesn't exist anywhere else. Oh, there's other bread. It'll even keep you alive for a time. But he is the only one that gives eternal life, the bread of life. That is, the bread that he claims to be is the bread that is beyond the best fortified bread. <laughs> it's, the, it's, it's, it's better than whole grain, organic bread. And it's because it is of life. Think about that for a moment. Life bread. Life bread. Now, I don't spend a whole lot of time in grocery stores. I have a witness here that will attest to that. But I, I do know that in many stores, they have entire sections devoted to organic this, fortified that. And that all may be very well and good. I, I have no opinion about that one way or the another, another. But I also know that many of the foods claim to lower cholesterol. They claim to raise your metabolism, to help your concentration to provide lasting happiness and a lot of friends. Just look at a beer commercial. So I take all of these claims with a very large dose of blood pressure raising salt. Because there's no vitamin, there's no organic miracle fruit that is going to do more than temporarily help you. And it may help you. I don't, I don't deny that at all. But that's a best-case scenario. 
So what the Savior offers to you is truly life-giving bread because he says himself, I am the living bread. See, he's making this, again, an emphatic claim. I, I am the living bread. Now, this is very similar, but it's different. It explains more what he says, what he said before. See, when we, when we think about the image that's presented to us here, he's referring to his body. And so the mystery and the revelation here deepens, doesn't it? It's... It's more profound than we had previously thought, if we're just learning this. He's not speaking of crushed grain at all. He's not just referring to himself in a metaphorical way. He's actually referring to his own flesh, his own body, his own human nature. Well, okay. When he gives himself up to the death of the cross, he is giving himself so that the world may live. So that you may live. Even as the common bread is eaten to, to sustain life, so we must partake of the bread of life, the living bread, if we would have eternal life. If you don't, you cannot have life. Now, see, it's one thing to say that he gives his flesh, but then it's the other, another thing to say that whoever eats it. See, we might, in fact, memorialize greatly the soldier who gives his life so that the whole platoon is saved. That's, that's something that we would rejoice in, even though we would be sad that it required such a sacrifice. That's not the problem, that he jumped on the grenade. But whoever eats as in verse 54. And the Savior says that, and it must have shocked his audience. He told them that they must eat his flesh and drink his blood. And for one, for one who has not had their eyes opened and his heart softened, this is as offensive as anything can possibly be. In fact, we know that they were offended by what he said. But the cross is offensive. The empty tomb is offensive to the one who is dead in his sins. What he is telling them, what he's telling you, is that we must be united with him in his death if we want to live. That's the offensive thing. That's the stumbling block. That's where they were tripped up. See, that's why, for example, we read about the gospel being a stumbling block in various places in the, in the scriptures. I won't read them now. But I, this idea of, of someone hearing up to so far, a little bit here, a little bit there, but then there comes a point where we just can't get past this. It's a barrier that cannot be crossed. And I would say, yes, it cannot be crossed truly apart from the working of the Holy Spirit in us. See, it's not merely enough for him to be crucified. Because if he were still in the tomb, we would still be in our sins and we would not have eternal life. It is not merely enough to acknowledge that Jesus existed, but rather it is to place our trust upon him that what he has done actually was sufficient for your sins and for my sins. And that is actually applied to us by the Holy Spirit to actually see him for who he is the Savior, the promised one. So what Romans 8, the apostle there in that, the middle of asking numerous rhetorical questions in verses 31 through 30, 34, he says, what then shall we say to these things? What, what shall we say to what we've just heard? Well, in the context of Romans 8, he says, if God is for us, who can be against us? Well, that's true, of course. Yes, that is true. That God is supreme over all. 
But the context of what the apostle says there in Romans 8 makes all the difference because the next verse, verse 32 says, He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things, including eternal life? Including the promise of preservation unto the last day, wherein we are resurrected. Jesus Christ being the first fruits. So who is it that will bring a charge against God's elect, returning back to Romans 8? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen. Who is even at the right hand of God who also makes intercession for us. And so who can condemn? Who can charge us with anything? Who can cast us away from him? As we read elsewhere in the Gospel of John, there's not one that is going to slip through his fingers. See, if we are united with him in his death, if we partake of him by faith, of the flesh and the blood, we find our life in him because he who was raised, we are also raised with him. See, it's the son's purpose particularly to raise those who are united with him by faith. See, this is not simply a mystical view of blurring the distinctions between us and the Savior. That's been a problem in the church for the last century or so. That's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about us being united with him by faith. And that faith comes from God, and that coming to him is because the Father drew us, and yet we also express faith. And we express faith in knowing that, as the Scriptures say, that our old man was crucified with him, as we read in Romans 6. And further on says, for, we, for he who has died has been freed from sin. We died with him. We have been freed from sin. And then verse 8 says, now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ having been raised from the dead, dies no more, death no, ha longer having, no longer has dominion over him. And if we are in him, it no longer has dominion over you. And if death no longer has dominion over you, that though you die in this world, you will yet be raised on the last day, going back to John 6. You see, all these things form what you might say a perfect circle. We started with the promise, and we end up with the promise that those who have placed their trust in Jesus Christ will be raised at the last day. Well, how does that happen? Well, it happens because he was also raised. Why was he raised? Well, because he was put in the ground, because he was truly dead. Well, why did he die? He died for your sins. He died for my sins. Well, why did he do that? because it was a father's good pleasure to save a rotten sinner like you and me. So who gets the glory? Well, of course, Lord Jesus Christ gets all the glory. You don't get any of it. And yet you'll be glorified with him. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Let's pray. We come, our Heavenly Father, and ask that you would uh, cause us to rejoice, to truly perceive in greater part, in greater measure, certainly, what blessings we have in Jesus Christ. We ask that you would comfort us with the knowledge of your good purpose towards us, but also that we might that, that we might also pray and strive that others might also hear and believe. We ask that you would now bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. And we do continue worshiping and the giving of tithes and offerings.
Uh, congregation, I would invite you to look in your uh, bulletins for matters for prayer. Um, also, uh, either a little clarification or and one thing to add. Um, uh, I was uh, told right before the, the service that uh, Kelly's aunt had uh, passed away recently, right? And she was as one of those laborers that comes at the fifth hour, <laughs> at five o'clock in the afternoon, right? Made a profession of faith, a credible profession of faith uh, late in her life. And uh, he's asked, asked me to, to preach at the graveside, which I will happily do this coming Friday. So you can remember that matter uh, in prayer. Uh, also, uh, it's good to see Yolanda, good to see you here. Let's, let's pray that the physicians might uh, be granted wisdom to deal with what's, uh, what's going on. And also you may note that regarding Danielle, the prayer request has changed. She had her first session uh, in, the, in the prison. And uh, I'm going to invite you to ask her about that. But what she tells me is that it went very well. So, well, praise God. And so let's continue to pray for that. Also, uh, Jerry had a a uh, planned uh, medical procedure uh, Friday, and that's why they're not here today. So he just needs to take it easy for a while. So let's uh, remember our brother Jerry, among these other matters. Let, let us pray. We come, our Heavenly Father, and thank you for your care for us. And that, that care extends even to our death and our future resurrection. And that we have that hope now, and what a hope it is. We ask our Heavenly Father that you would give us a greater appreciation of that hope that we have, and also that you might in your good providence bring others in our path that would ask us of that hope that is within us. May we be ready to point any who come and ask to Jesus Christ. We ask also that, that you would help us together as a congregation to encourage one another, to strengthen and edify one another, and come alongside and help bear the burdens of one another. And we do, Father, thank you for this privilege that we can do such. We do pray that you would also keep us in your care as you have promised. We know that it is a sure promise, but we also know that sometimes that care means that we endure a long season sometimes of trials and frailty. So for the many requests that are represented to us in our bulletin, we certainly do continue to pray for our brother Kelly. We do thank you that he's here also today, but also as uh, his aunt is, her remains are laid to rest uh, this Friday that, that uh, the gospel would be preached and that the gospel would be heard by those who are there. We ask our Heavenly Father for Marsha's angiogram upcoming, for all these other requests, certainly for Yolanda that she would receive the care that she needs and that her physicians would have wisdom for our brother Jerry, pray that you give him patience to sit still and to not overdo it. We thank you that all went well. He's home resting now. We do pray, our Heavenly Father, that you would bless, continue to bless uh, Danielle and those she is laboring with in the prison among the women there. May she be given both clarity of thought and speech, but also discernment, as she will no doubt learn it is a different world on the other side of that wire. And we ask that you would <clears throat> also use her uh, to draw others to Christ, and that she would be a good witness and testimony as she's uh, teaching and ministering uh, to those who are there and incarcerated. We ask our Heavenly Father that you would continue uh, to bring uh, healing uh, to uh, Pastor America and that you would uh, strengthen him so that he is uh, even stronger than uh, before. We also ask for the greater church. We 
We know that uh, up and down our state, uh, whether it is in our own communion or the fraternal churches, that there's a great amount of pressure uh, to conform to this world. May, may we not do so. And yet may we, with uh, joy, speak and preach of who Jesus Christ is. We ask your blessing upon that, whether it is here, whether it is in the other RCUS churches, whether it is in uh, the OPC, the URC, all the faithful churches. We know that uh, there is no place, and certainly not this state, that suffers from too much gospel preaching. So we do ask, our Heavenly Father, also, again, that as we are in this season where uh, politics and electoral politics seems to take such a, a front uh, seat in our minds, it is, always seems to be present. We ask that you would give us both consolation in knowing that Christ is King, whether or not the magistrate acknowledges that or not, but also that we would both be given wisdom in what we do say and how we vote, but also that you would, in your good time and will, raise up godly leaders in the civil realm, even as we would pray you would raise up godly leaders in the church and in the homes. We ask that you would hear us because we, we love uh, the country, the nation in which we live, but we love the kingdom of Christ more. We ask that you would hear us now for the name and the sake of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, let us now turn to 273. 273, and I know this is a day which uh, many people will be eager to leave, to be with family and so on, but just to let you know that there are going to be some very light refreshments downstairs if you would like to stay in fellowship. So let us rise to sing 273.
congregation receive the Lord's parting blessing. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.